We've been talking for the past several weeks about the shadows of Jesus. We talked about the veil. We talked about the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about the tabernacle. I want to dive into the light of this thing today. Jump over to Psalms chapter 8 with me, and I'm going to read this very quickly. This is going to be something I'm going to talk about the next several weeks that I believe is going to bring us to challenge our idea of who we are, because once you find out who you are, then you can find out what you can do. Psalms chapter 8, starting in verse 1, says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him for you have made him catch this verse here you have made him a little lower than the angels now louisville you'll remember this a few years ago south i want to help you catch up here that word angels there has been dumbed down by the translators because of the implications that came with that the original hebrew word there is not angels it is the word jehovah in other words, he says, I have made you a little lower than myself. Remember how he made Adam in his image and in his likeness, in his own image. He made him in his image and then said, man is to have dominion in the earth. Image comes before dominion. So everybody is wanting to walk in dominion authority. But for you to walk in that power, you have got to have the likeness. He made him a little lower than himself. And he said, I have crowned him with glory and with honor. In other words, I took the stuff that made me God and I put it on man. So he took the glory reserved for him and put it on us as a crown. Verse 6 says, you have made him to have, talking about man, dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. I want to tie this scripture in to one over in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he, this being God, might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth inside of him. It initially saying that God's intent was to take Jesus and then take everything in heaven and everything in in earth and put it all encapsulated in him. Now jump down to verse 22 in that same chapter. It says he put all things under Jesus feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, his body, the fullness of him. So I'm going to take everything. I'm going to put it in Christ, and then I'm going to take all of Christ, find me a body for Christ, and put everything inside of that body. Listen, this thing is going to get good for you in a second. So, some of y'all are going to drive through the drive through and quicken when you catch this in a couple of days. One more verse. Jump down to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. It says this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able catch it, to comprehend. He said the, the crux of all this is a comprehension thing. In other words, it's not are you anointed, it's can you think on the level of which you have been anointed because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it's not whether or not it's going to happen, it's can you think like one that can make it happen because you, you won't be as Christ has done, you will be as you think. So now your mind is the place where your decisions are all ultimately going to be made and so I've got to think on the level that he's taking my life into and so there's a lot of people that have been anointed for wealth but they can't stop thinking broke you've been you've been anointed to prosper but you can't stop thinking lack you've been anointed to be whole but you can't stop thinking broken and you've not learned to live on the level of mindset that is required for you to walk it out in your manifestation some of us have great gifts but we think we are nothing so we never 
manifest anything. We've got destiny, but we don't think we have great destiny. And you've got to learn, Colossians 3 says, to set your mind on things above where the anointing is. Not on things of this earth, not on your nickname, not on what they've been calling you, not on what you've been labeled, but who you really are when you came out of heaven and what God stuck inside of your spirit. Then he finishes like this. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you, you may be filled with the fullness of of God. So we've got Psalms chapter 8, we've got Ephesians, and let's turn this thing loose and tie it together. I want to help you understand what God is trying to get you to become. I'm in a season of digging right now, and I'm in a season of searching for the supernatural. Everybody's wondering where did the signs, the miracles, and the wonders go? Why don't we see it? Why do we shout in service about what we never see with our eyes? And, and he, he let us know that greater works than him would we do, but to be honest, with you sometimes it feels like we're not even seeing the glory of Jesus let alone a greater works glory and if I'm honest that bothers me if God said I'm supposed to walk in it if he said I'm supposed to have it and we're not seeing it that messes with me I can't just relax and say that it is the way it is God, God certainly does not need me to defend him but I believe some of y'all remember I dove into this in our losing my religion series I believe that heaven and earth were built together they were built in tandem. They were built on parallel tracks. So we don't have heaven out here doing its own thing and earth down here doing its own thing. They were built to work together. They were built to be connected together. I believe that, that God built an invisible realm called the heavens. The Bible says actually that the heavens are for God and the earth is for the sons of men. And so there's an invisible realm called the heavens and it is the original realm, meaning it is the first realm. It's the parent realm. So Ian says that the stuff that you can see is a lesser realm or a lesser authority. In other words, if you can see it, he can change it. Now that's a whole shout point right there. If you can see it, he can change it. So the dominant realm being the heaven realm is invisible. The word invisible does not have to do with existence. It just means your eye doesn't have the ability to perceive it. It's a perception thing. It's there, but my eye don't have the ability to pick up the images. So it is invisible. In other words, it is there. I just can't perceive it. It is the realm that God moves in. It is the realm that God operates in. The Bible says that the things that are seen, they are temporary. Hebrews says that the things that are seen are made out of the things that are not seen, and things unseen are eternal. So there's this unchanging world above our heads, but our eye can't pick it up. Problem is, the Bible says that everything that we need is locked in this realm. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. I, I, the, here's the problem. Problem. Being blessed in a heavenly place don't do me no good in the earth. That, I appreciate that God has money for me in heaven. I need to pay bills right now. So my challenge as a Christian and a man of faith is not to create things that have never been created, but how can I move what has already been finished and stored up for me in that dimension? How do I pull it into mine? Come on, stay with me. We're going to go somewhere right here. So God builds this invisible realm and then God creates the the earth realm in the as a replica of the invisible one and he puts a person as a replica of him in his likeness in his image to operate and govern earth in the same laws that heaven is governing it he, he intended then for earth to operate just like heaven the brilliant late dr miles monroe challenged my theology and opened my mind to what we're talking about right now he had a theory that perhaps we cannot find the garden Garden of Eden because Eden wasn't a place at all. It was an atmosphere. Eden was not perfect because of the size of its flowers or the taste of the fruit. Eden was perfect because it was the place where relationship with God was uncorrupted. He was banned from the garden, which Miles Monroe described actually as this. This was his study. You can believe what you want. I ascribe to this thought pattern. In Hebrew, the words are written in strokes, and Eden has a number of different strokes in it. 
it, and each stroke means something different. So, so Eden had strokes, and here's the meanings of each stroke in that. It, one means spot, one means open, one means open door, one means presence, and one means delightful place. One word. So in other words, Eden, listen to the def definition, literally means a spot for the moment where the presence of God is an open door to heaven. God took heaven and made it touch earth and put man in that place. He said in Eden then is not really a physical place. Eden is an environment. That's why you can't find it. It don't exist physically. Why it wasn't a physical place? It was an atmosphere, a presence, if you will, that came down on a spot and man lived in that atmosphere. So when man moved, the spot moved with him. So when Adam sins, God asks him, where, where are you? Not because he can't see him and not because he can't locate him, but because Adam was no longer in the spot. The angels banish him and the shield begin to shield the spot of God. That responsibility moves to the Ark of the Covenant. We see the angels with their wings spread across, shielding God's presence from the people. It shifts to what we talked about a few weeks ago, the veil in the temple becoming a barrier between the presence and the people it was all because Adam lost the spot so now we've got heaven and we've got earth and as I told you they're built to work connected so if you go through the Bible you start seeing moments where the connection opens up you see where where Jacob has a dream and he sees heaven open and angels going up and down between the two you see a time in Enoch where he goes up and disappears and don't never come back we see a time with Thomas where he literally disappears and materializes in a different geographical location. You got all these crazy things happening in the Bible where the heavens would open and they would close. And so I believe that there is a heavenly realm and an earthly realm, and then there are openings between the two. They were supposed to work together. So God originally puts Adam in the garden and asks him, gives him authority, tells him, you got dominion over this. Now let's talk about that dominion word right there because some of you saying when are you gonna get this thing rolling hang on I'm gonna get it right here God makes Adam before he makes the garden he made the person before he gave him the spot to live in now that's different from other creations because because God usually builds the thing that's going to sustain the thing and then plants the thing in it in other words he didn't build the grass before he built the Sun because he knew the grass would need the Sun to sustain it God didn't make cows before he made grass because he knew the cattle would need the grass to sustain it. But he makes man, and then he creates the garden. He creates the garden after that. That lets us know that according to the pattern of him, the garden had to have existed before the man was made. But he gives it entrance into the earth after man is made. Why? Because the garden is not a place. The garden is the presence. And he takes him and puts him in the garden, in the presence, and tells him four things. Be fruitful multiply, subdue the earth, and have dominion. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and have dominion. I want to submit to you that oftentimes we read that as four individual statements, but these were really four sequential steps. So the first step is be fruitful. Work on your personal character. Develop the fruit of the Spirit. The next declaration is multiply, because if you are multiplying before you are fruitful, you are only going to multiply your unfruitfulness. So he he says, now, once we get you worked out, start multiplying. The word multiply there does not mean have babies. You are not going to believe what this translation means. It literally means speak to. In other words, Adam, this is how the world is existing outside of you. Now I'm going to take you in Eden, in this spot, and I want you to take Eden and multiply it all over the earth. So Adam is operating in the earth like God. You, you never heard of physical labor until after the curse of sin. Adam didn't have to sweat over the ground. He didn't have to labor over the fruits. It was only after the curse that he has to start working with his hands. Why? Here we go. Because the earth was not meant to respond to Adam's hands. It was built to respond to his voice. I'm about to feel my help now. God created Adam to operate just like he did. What happens when God speaks? When God speaks, he is not just communicating. When God speaks, he is literally creating. So God takes Adam and puts him in the garden, and Adam is there to operate like God does in heaven. The Bible says 
Adam. God tells him, whatever you call it, that's what it will be. So the God takes a place called the earth, creates Adam in his image, and makes a spot called Eden in heaven's image, and tells him to make earth operate just like I'm doing it up here. How does God operate in heaven? He declares and it becomes. So if you have been made a son of God, God said, I've made you joint heirs with Jesus. If I am joint heirs with Jesus, I don't need anything. I don't pray to try to manifest or, or make things become that not already are. I speak to what already is and move it from one realm to the other. Some of the reason that you have not been receiving what you keep praying about is you keep spending time praying over what you should be talking to. Lord God. So Adam gets to operate like God because he'd been crowned with the glory of what God is. The word glory there in the Old Testament literally means weight or kabod or authority. That when Adam would speak, it wouldn't just be because a man spoke, it's because when he spoke, he had Adam or he had heaven backing up what he said. God sent the animals over to Adam and said, Adam, whatever you want it to be, that's what it will be. Do you know what God spoke to me? He told me that in this season, you are about to not just prophesy things that are to come, but he's about to release something that he called creative pro prophetic potential. Creative prophetic potential. Not just people who see a future, but people who speak and heaven backs up and creates what they declare. Now, I feel you struggling there, but, but the woman with the issue of blood, check it out, did not have a word that if she touched his garment, she'd be healed. She created her healing future process in herself. She said, I believe within herself, if I do this, God will do that. In other words, you are going to be able to declare a thing and the weight of heaven get behind your words and make what you declared in the earth realm happen. Why? Because you were created to rule the world with your words. That's why every idle word is important and the power of life and death is in the tongue. You can kill it with your mouth or you can make it live with your mouth. But for God's sake, you have got to understand that power has been put in your declaration. Would you just slap your neighbor a virtual high five right now and declare in those comments you can't afford to keep your mouth shut. You cannot afford to keep your mouth shut. And now, now let's turn loose this thing another area here. Adam has sinned. Adam has sinned and he's lost this thing that made him have the image. And now because Adam was the first, theologians would call him the federal head. He is the representative. So the Bible says that when Adam sinned, all sinned. When Adam died, all died. For all have sinned and fallen short of glory. So now, what does that mean? That means everybody is talking and ain't nothing moving. Everybody is declaring and ain't nothing happening. Now we're declaring healings and we're not seeing manifestation. Why? Because the glory is lost and we don't even know what it really is to go back and get it. Glory is not heaven. Glory is not gold dust blowing out of air vents. Glory is the weight of God getting behind your life and backing up your declaration. It comes in levels. Scriptures declare that as you mature in life, you move from glory to glory or from weight to weight, from authority to authority and, and, and you'll see it sometimes where there's some people that pray for years and it takes years for something to manifest but then for some reason you get around this one person and they can say it one time and everything starts falling into place on their declaration I, I don't know what kind of church I'm talking to right now but but I feel like I'm talking to a few folk who are like me and you are tired of being the one who has to say the same thing over five years six years ten years I want to be able to look at my mountain at one time and say you got to move I want to be able to look at waters and say part and they respond I want to have so much glory behind me where I say this that you got to go and this mountain is removed and cast into the sea I believe that I'm talking to at least a few different folks I believe I'm talking to a few different people who understand that it's time to declare and see even 10-year prayer requests snap open in an instant I'm ready to talk and it move as I speak 
speak. I want to declare and see bodies respond. I want to declare and see limbs grow back. I want to declare and see dead bodies come back to life. Does anybody want to be a part of that kind of church? If I'm talking to you right now, would you just lift your hands in your living room and declare it's getting ready to happen right now? Come on, make it happen in your house. It's getting ready to happen right now. Things are getting ready to change right now. The heavens are about to open right now. So we got Adam here. Let me get back to this. And we got a severe problem for Adam now because he is trapped in a world that no longer responds to his voice. A world that he used to rule by way of decree is no longer paying him any attention. And God didn't curse Adam's voice. He cursed the ground and said, now not only you will you, the only way you will produce is through your sweat and labor. You will no longer increase through words. And, and let me tell you something. God said that there was a mist in the garden, that, that, that there was no man to tend it and no man to take care of it. In other words, God was preserving his seed in the earth with a mist because there was nobody around to be able to handle it. Can I tell you something right now? The seed for your future is already in the soil of your soul, but God has not caused it to rain because you've got to be developed enough to tend it for the harvest to come. But I hear something off in the distance in this season right now. I hear a, a sound of an abundance of rain starting to crack open and seeds that have been on the inside of you. It's about to rain. It's about to start raining on seeds of potential, seeds of wealth, seeds of healing, seeds of holiness, seeds of power, seeds of deliverance. When God caused it to rain, what was already planted in the inside of you since before the creation of the earth starts to manifest in your life. If you would just slap yourself a high five and encourage yourself and say the rain is on the way. Come on. The rain is on the way. Come on. Put that in those comments. The rain is on the way. So Adam sins and he's short of glory, trapped in a world that won't listen to him. Romans chapter 8. I don't have time to really deal with this, but it's one of my favorite chapters. It says that the earth was subjected to futility, not willingly. The earth Earth did not want to be in chaos. Why do we have tornadoes? Because the earth didn't have anybody to listen to. Why is there floods and tsunamis? Because the earth don't have anybody to listen to. The water don't know how far to come because that was the original responsibility of a man. I'm preaching better than you typing right now. The earth was subjected to futility. The earth is in chaos. It literally says it's groaning, waiting on the sons of men. And the other force that was cast down from heaven has now been proclaimed the prince of the power of the air. So now he hovers over the earth and orchestrates it like a puppet. Satan is literally called God, little God, little G, little God of this world. Why? Because Adam forfeited the crown, forfeited the weight, or surrendered the authority. The authority has now shifted, and now Adam is talking, and ain't nothing happening. So here comes Jesus, which is called the second, or more accurately, the last Adam. Ain't that interesting? Interesting. If you want to know what Jesus came to give you, you ought to just run back and look at everything that the first Adam lost. Lord God, those of you who are wondering what Jesus gave you to operate in, go back and look at what Adam surrendered. That right there would have made me run all the way to my kitchen for a juice box right now. That is huge. So, so here comes Jesus in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And there was nothing created that was not created by him. Him. And then you get down here into verses 12 through 14. And the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. Catch it. And we beheld his glory. Now the glory's in the earth again. What does Jesus start doing? Jesus starts talking to fig trees. That's why you ought not worry about how people feel about you or think about you when you start speaking to stuff that seems a little bit crazy. Jesus talked to trees. May nobody eat from you again. And the tree fell over dead. He walks out on the edge of a boat and starts talking to water and the water goes calm. He starts talking to wind and the wind dissipates. He didn't lay hands on Lazarus at all. He stood outside of the tomb. Lord Jesus and sent his word in and, and when he declared it Lazarus the body heard his declaration and responded so we jump into Hebrews chapter 2 and it says that it makes the captain of our salvation Jesus perfect when many sons are raised 
to glory. That word son there has nothing to do with gender. That word son has to do with position, position. And so if you read about position and sonship, it is an extremely important theological thread that runs through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus came to qualify us as sons. Come on, just elbow your children and tell them we qualify. Come on, slap yourself. I'm qualified. You should have lost it on your couch right there because there's a few of you that didn't get it all right in life, but you're still qualified. You made some dumb decisions, but you are still qualified. You have dated some dummies, but you are still qualified. If you are a son, you don't have to stand outside and ask, can you have it? By the fact of you being a son in Christ, you are inside the house and have access to everything that the Father has. So I don't have to beg for what's already been paid for. I can declare it and it be mine. So this reveals to us that God did not have just one son. He had one begotten son. Then the rest of us are engrafted or adopted sons. The Bible says we are joint heirs. So whatever the father got fallen on Jesus is going to fall on Josh. Whatever the father has fallen on Jesus is going to fall on you. Because I have been raised and seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now stay with me here. His goal, catch this y'all, his goal was for us to behold what glory looks like in the earth. This thing has not been seen since the garden in Genesis. It's not been seen anybody consistently ruling their world with their words. But his intent was not just to come and get you saved and attending church. I'm going to say something that may be bold that I've only had the guts to say in one or two places, but I feel like you can handle it. The intent of Jesus coming was not just to get you to heaven. The intent of God coming was the reestablishment of Adam's glory on the face of the earth. That's why God said, I want you to pray that my kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. We preach Jesus and we understand that he is the epicenter of this entire thing. Everything we are hinges on Christ crucified, Christ buried, and Christ resurrected. He is the center of it all, but stay with me here that don't mean he is it all Jesus didn't even spend time preaching Jesus that often he spent the majority of his time preaching the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like and for us we've got to make sure that after we preach Jesus we preach what Jesus preached the church don't even know what the kingdom is let alone the whole earth and we got to get the kingdom in the church before the kingdom can move to the world we know church we know come to church we know lift your hands. We know attend a service. But I have been here right now, put on this earth to represent the glory of God in my time and in my generation. If you with me, say yes. So I'm done. I'm going to push this thing one more thing and then we go and home. You already home. Lord, what am I talking about? So, so they got out on the boat and the wind starts blowing and the waves start beating so much so that the water begins to fill the boat. And read this story when we're done and catch the frustration of Jesus. Jesus is asleep. He it didn't say he's just resting, kick back. My man is asleep. Why? Because the disciples now for almost three years have been beholding glory. Everybody else hasn't been able to see this thing, but they have been beholding glory. So he goes to sleep and, and he says essentially, I'm going to sit this storm out. Lord, you ought to hear this thing. I'm going to sit this storm out. The elements start moving. The waves start crashing. The boat starts sinking. They immediately become fearful and run to Jesus to wake him up. Jesus, frustrated, walks to the end of the boat, extends his hand, and says, peace, be still. And then he turns around frustrated. He ain't frustrated with the wind. He's not frustrated with the storm because storms are necessary and storms are common. What his frustration was was the people that he'd been walking with. He turns around to his disciples and says, why have you been so afraid? Where is your faith? 
Where is your faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you know what he's asking? He's saying, you've been with me all this time. Why did you still feel the need to come wake me up to do what I gave you the power to do? When the waves stop act, start acting, you've seen how glory works. You ought to go try it for yourself. When the waves come in the boat, here's what I'm trying to get you to. You talk to it. That, that, that's what I'm saying. You don't go beg what's already been bought. You command it to happen in the name of Jesus that you've been given a seat in. There are people that are listening to me right now. You're like, man, that's all good. But for me, I'm just trying to go to church. This dude's talking about controlling weather and elements. I just want to wear my armor t-shirt. I just want to go and put a couple dollars in a bucket and go back home till next Sunday and leave it there. That that posture is literally why that they translated the Bible and dumbed it down to lower than angels instead of lower than Jehovah because of the implications and the responsibility that that thing puts on you. You have been built to carry the image of the Father, not your earthly Father, but your heavenly Father. That's why anything other than how your heavenly Father operates bothers your soul. If you are sick, it bothers your soul. Why? Because that ain't how your father operates if you are broke it bothers your soul why because something about this poverty don't line up with the image I've been created to walk in I was not built this way I was built in the image of a father who knows no pain and knows no lack no no lack of resources no bondage I bear that image and that's why all this stuff gets to me and that's why there are churches even like yours that, that, that are willing to say I don't even want to tolerate a little devil in in my life. I don't want to deal with any of this. There are Christians who are just ready to get out of earth into heaven and then there are those of us who say, God I want heaven here on earth and it's th those of us that have that responsibility that realize that some of my choice is starting to slip away. Why? Because I belong to God. I I'm going to just put this out there. If you don't like it you can email somebody. I don't believe that everybody has the same level of free will. You may believe that but if that's the case you ought to run over to Jonah and ask him how he felt about his free will, free will after he graduated Whale University. He did everything in his power to walk out his own choice, but he belonged to God. And there was a group of you that are in the earth right now that say, I tried to run and I couldn't get away. I tried to leave this thing and I couldn't slip far enough. I didn't even have a chance to get as far away as I wanted to. And that's why some of you are even trying to go back to the world world now and it won't work. The only dance you got is a church dance. You out here trying to twerk. It don't even look right no more. You got a church dance and that's it because you belong to God now. You can't go back. That, that's why things that should have killed you couldn't kill you. That, that, that's why you tried to cross the line and still couldn't cross the line. Why? You, I, listen, I think this thing is for you and all nations. You are a tithe. You belong to God. You are not your own. I believe that all nations is a tithe in the earth. You've been bought with a price. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus. And so if he's got you, you might as well settle into the fact that you are his and you can't even get away. Embrace it. You belong to God. You are God's tithe in the earth. Now here's a good declaration for you. What did he say he would do with the tithe in the earth? He said, I will open up you the windows. The people that belong to me, this tithe, I will open up you and heaven will enter the earth through you. I will pour you out. He didn't say I'd bless you. He said you are the blessing. I'm going to take you and pour you out into the earth. I'm going to use you to get my stuff out here. You are the only thing then that can change this nation. You are the only thing that can change this city. You are the tithe that can make the difference happen. You are what's necessary for the future. And I know this is heavy but I didn't come to preach you a message today. I'm on assignment now. This this word is for this people. It is time for you to come up to the next level of recognition of who you are. Ephesians says it was the intent of God to take all things in heaven, all things in earth, and put them in Christ. Remember that verse? Ephesians 1 10. But then it says that Christ wants to dwell in a body or the body of Christ. Come on, that's us. Which is the fullness of him. We are the body of Christ. And then remember he jumps down to chapter 3. 
hurry. Let's take this thing home. And says, now, now can you think like that? Can you, can you comprehend that? Can you ha- comprehend that God put everything in Jesus and then wrap your mind around the fact that everything that was in Jesus, he wants to now put in you. That that is the fullness of God coming into the earth. That means that I ain't never been in church. The church has always been in me. Everything that I need to know, I already know in me. Everything that I'm going to be, I already am in me. Everything that that he has me doing everywhere I'm going to go, I've already been there. I've just got to walk this thing out. That's why Jesus said, Lord, I feel this thing. If you are in me and my words, he is the word, is in you. I could run this room. That's why the psalmist said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all, all, all that is within me. Let, let it praise him. Let the God that I've put in you praise the God in heaven. So when he says, let two come, come into agreement as touching anything, it is not even necessarily me coming in g- agreement with somebody else around me. It is the God in me coming into agreement with the God in heaven. If I can let this thing in me loose and he can find agreement with his will up here, down here, anything is possible. But it's all a matter of comprehension. Can you think like this? Can you walk like this in your mind? Can your mind grasp that all of this is inside of you? That's why your life is not a thing that you get to determine. It is a purpose that you get to discover. You find that thing in you. I don't go out here looking to find me. I find me searching for the God in me. And so we're always looking for God to fix our problems, to fix our scenarios. What, what, even look at that when Jesus ascends and the disciples are standing there gazing and the angels appear and say, what y'all looking at, basically? What, why are you still here gazing? Go to Jerusalem. Why? Because the thing that you just saw is about to make his move into you. We look to God to fix our problems, but look at what happened. We, we, we look at God and say, why did you let that happen to us? Why did this thing happen in my life? What did I do to deserve this? And Jesus is saying, I appreciate you looking up here, but I already put the authority in you to change what you're looking at. I filled you with the fullness of God. If you don't like what you're looking at, here's your word. Word. Talk to that thing. My prayer for you right now is that would you, God would allow you to go through a scenario that would heal your self-image, that would get rid of your self-degrading perspectives. I declare that over you, that God would take you into a a radical revelation of who you really are, a radical revelation of what he paid for you to become. I decree over you a resurrection of dead faith. Dead faith be resurrected. I I declare over you a pursuit, a pursuit of a life that is reflective of the glory that he paid so heavy a price for you to be able to walk in. My declaration over you is that the earth will begin to respond to you again. That sickness will begin to respond to you. That disease would respond to you. Infirmity would respond to you. That death would hear you and shake. That poverty would hear you and crack. That suicide would hear you and flee. That instability would see you and fall. And may we walk in bold, courageous hearts with tenacious minds into the life of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.